With your Bibles and study guides open now, to we want to look at the final events that lead up to the second coming of Christ and what life will be like in the millennial kingdom. We've given you just a little foretaste of that in the scriptures. But in this brief series of sermons that I know some of you think will never end, we've tried to outline and define, more importantly, the major prophetic events that will precede the return of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on this earth as it now exists in heaven. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer, do we not? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth, say the next line, as it is in heaven. Now looking at our world today, I'm sure you agree, we are in desperate need for God's kingdom to come and come quickly. I mean, ready right now, even though the Lord Jesus come. Now throughout the ages and generations, mankind has always failed, and he always will fail, to, uh, in his desire to achieve harmony among humanity apart from God. It, because the lack of that draws us to God. The fact that man can't not make it, he can't achieve it, draws us to someone who can. That's the history of mankind. And as long as humans are in charge of governments, that will be the future of mankind. Because every form of government is tainted by the curse of sin. They're all towers of Babel that uh, will soon fail, they will soon fall because they cannot achieve or accomplish their lofty goals. Every generation tries it, every administration tries it, but they always end up in abject failure because they try to do it apart from God. And again, the lack, the, the, the lack of our ability to do that is what draws us to Him. The age of innocence many, many years ago gave way to the age of conscience, which gave way to the age of law, and then gave way to the age of grace. Then came the Dark Ages, followed by the Reformation, and then the Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution. And then the modern age, the postmodern age, the post-God age, and now we live in the age of rebellion against God. And contrary to the hope of many, there is no human solution to the predicament in which we now live. There's no human solution to it. There's no use looking for one, because there isn't one. Next comes the age of judgment. It's called the tribulation, and the times of tribulation, Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, the time when God pours out his wrath upon those who refuse to receive his son as their Savior and Lord, and with just the word of his mouth, it will take just one word as it was in Genesis, it, so it will be in Revelation. He will destroy all of the enemies of God along with their corrupt systems of government and religion and that's what's going to be wiped off the face of the earth. All the corruption, all the sin. Then after removing the curse of sin and restoring the earth to what it was like in the Garden of Eden, we're going to enter that thousand-year reign <clears throat> with Christ, with peace on earth. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. And then into the new heaven and new earth, which we'll hopefully talk about next Sunday. And we, that will be where we will exist in heaven for forever, world without end. Do not believe these kooks who say the world's coming to an end. No, this age is coming to a close, but it's always world without end. Now, I have been told by some that I have no brain, but I've been told by others that I have a, I'm a left brain person, which means I am, have to, uh, I'm more analytical and logical than I am emotional or intuitive, whatever that means. So to understand the various end time events, I like to use charts such as the one you have in your stack of stuff this morning. If you'll get it out, it looks like that. It's on the little pamphlet called A Timeline of End Time Events. I even sent it out on the email <clears throat> so that you might have that. But you're going to need that this morning along with your other study guide, if you will. So I want you to use that chart. It's the big picture, if you will. It's the explosion, the diagram of the prophecy of Daniel that's illustrated by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. I want to prove to my wife that I was paying attention in Bible college class 100 years ago. The book of Daniel is the glove, but the book of Revelation is the hand in the glove. The glove is worth of no value. It cannot do anything without a hand is in it. And so the book of Daniel is the glove. The book of Revelation is the hand in the glove. And this describes this whole thing right there. Then that little green chart describes the book of Revelation. Now, if you notice at the top left-hand corner, it mentions the church age. 
See it up there at the top left-hand corner? It began, the church age began on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it will end on the day of the rapture, which is the next event on God's prophetic calendar. Now, let me give you some scriptural proof of that. This is back on your study guide for the sermon. In John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus told his disciples, and we always hear this at somebody's death, but it doesn't mean that. He says, if I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you that where I am, there you may be also. That's not the second coming. That's the rapture of the church. Now that's John 14, 1 through 3. How about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 17? It describes how this is going to take place. You've heard it a hundred times, hear it one more. The Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. At that time, those who receive Christ during the church age, from Pentecost to the rapture, shall rise from their graves, be caught up with those of us who may still be alive in that day, and in the twinkling of an eye, our bodies will be transformed and reunited with our souls and transported to meet the Lord where? In the air. Not on the earth, that's coming, but in the, earth, on the, on, in the air. 1 Corinthians 15 explains how that's going to happen. He says the trumpet's going to sound, the dead will be raised from their graves, and then in the twinkling of an eye, these corrupt, natural, mortal bodies will be changed into incorruptible, spiritual, and immortal bodies and transported into the heavens to meet the Lord in the air. Star Trek gave us a little example of that. Not totally. You can't drive that all the way to the bank, but you see they can get into one place and all of a sudden be in another. That maybe gave us some idea. Not going to be quite like that, but they tried to match it anyway. Beloved, let me close this out with this now. This is a sign. The rapture is a signless event, which means it's not connected to or predicated upon any other event. And Jesus said, only God the Father knows when the rapture will come, which means it is always imminent. Steve and I have been having a conversation about this for the last week. It's always imminent, which means we should always be ready to be removed from this earth, always keep short accounts with God, always stay caught up on your I love you's because you never know when that last uh, peck on the cheek is the last one you'll give or get. So make sure it's sloppy enough. Now, in our previous sermons, we said there will be several attempts to defeat and destroy the nation of Israel, including the Psalm 83 war, maybe the Gog and Magog war. We understand that. The chart that you have there does not reflect the Psalm 83 war, so that must be happened before the beginning of the Revelation. However, if you look down that list on the left-hand side, let me make sure I can get this right here. Down that left-hand side right there, you will see what is, they call WW1 of the tribulation. You see that? Say Amen. All right. We may still be here for the Psalm 83 war. We, that's the, we, we may still be here for the first phase of the Gog-Magog war. But then again, we may not. Why? Because we may not be here because of the rapture. For we cannot know when these events will occur or our rapture will occur or when they will ha happen finally. However, what we do know is this, that we will be raptured from the earth before the tribulation begins because the rapture other than the fact that we won't be here during it, has nothing to do with the tribulation. The tribulation begins when that, uh, the Antichrist signs that peace treaty with Israel. But the, the Lord told the church at Philadelphia, to which the true church today belongs, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And beloved, there's not one reference to the church from Revelation chapter 6 all the way through Revelation 19. Saints, yes, but not Christians, not the church, not the bride of Christ, nothing. From chapter 6 through 19, which means we won't be here through some of these things that you find to the right of, the, of that list. Now, so at some point after the rapture of the church, perhaps the Gog-Magog war is heating up and gaining momentum, and the Antichrist is going to be exposed, not necessarily revealed, but he will be exposed and he will somehow achieve a seven-year peace deal with the nation of Israel, uh, which officially starts the time of tribulation. He would allow them to rebuild their temple right near the Temple Mount. So uh, we have that to look forward to. That's going to be the official start. Now the Antichrist promises peace, 
but he will try to achieve that the only way that we know how to achieve peace on this earth, and that is through war. It takes war to bring about peace. And then that war causes famine and disease and death like the world's never seen before. Notice on your chart when God pours out his wrath upon the earth, a third of the earth, a third of the sea, a third of the fresh water, and a third of the heavens will be destroyed. So you have both natural events such as war and supernatural events such as the God's wrath being poured out on the earth. And then God allows the earth to be invaded by demonic beings. And another third of the people is killed, in effect ending the Gog-Magog war prior to, just at the prior to the mid-tribulation. But now notice also back a little bit that 144,000 Jewish witnesses during this first three and a half years are spreading the gospel around the world. You also have two Jewish witnesses whom I think will be Moses and Elijah resurrected to stand before the people of God. And they're going to be proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem. When somebody walks in front of them, they will hear the gospel in their language, not the language of Moses and Elijah, but their language. And they're going to be killed and, and be shown in the streets for three days, but be raised again because they can't be killed. It's going to be something, a sight to see. God's going to protect them from the Antichrist. And uh, as the chart illustrates, this could be the time of the great evangelistic harvest. It could also be the great time of the great martyrdom of the saints. Now, the second half of the tribulation begins when the Antichrist is revealed. Why? What does he do? Antichrist means false Christ, pseudo-Christ. And they think he is the Christ, but he's a false Christ. And when he goes into the newly built temple in Jerusalem, uh, desecrates it in some way, we don't know exactly how, maybe slaughters a pig on the altar. Uh, he removes every semblance of God. He declares himself to be God, and then he demands to be worshipped as God. Ah, that's when... The eyes are open, eyes of the Jews are open, and they see they've been duped. Revelation 13, 15 through 18. John said, The Antichrist will require everyone from that point on, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast and the number of its name. And of course, we know the number is 666, and it will be the epitome of man the end of mankind. By the way, the, the, the instructor in our recent class on Revelation said something that I, with which I agree. He says that's the ultimate worship of a man. Who are you going to worship? You're going to worship the beast, you're going to worship God. <clears throat> At that moment, the eyes of the Jews will be open. They're going to see how they were deceived of the Antichrist, and most of them will flee to Petra. And notice up there, they will, um, they will be protected for 1,260 days. God's going to provide for them. God's going to protect them. And this may find this interesting. I believe Jesus will visit Petra before he uh, comes back and lands upon the Mount of Olives. Now, many people will be martyred for their faith, um, for not taking the, uh, the mark of the beast, but God then will pour out his wrath upon those who do take the mark of the beast. That's why I keep telling you, if you have relatives that are going to be left behind, for God's sake, tell them, don't take the mark of the beast. He will pour out his wrath. You're talking about plagues with sores that will not heal. The rest of the water supply is going to be destroyed. The full heat of the sun is going to be released. Can you imagine that? Remember, Jesus referred to this time as what? As the great tribulation suffering such as the world had never seen before, nor will ever see again. But then another war begins, which is called Armageddon. The final battle between God and all the forces of evil. The prophet Zechariah said, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, right near the end, I'm talking about days, uh, God will gather all of the balance of the nations of the world to come against Jerusalem. Now, God will try to do this, but it will be God who will do it. And uh, while the battle will be fought in and around the city of Jerusalem, the valley of Megiddo, which is some 60 miles north of Jerusalem, is where the armies of the world will assemble, as many armies of the past have assembled before. Various armies have fought countless battles in that valley throughout history. But in Revelation 16, 12 through 16, John said, when the angel pours out the sixth bowl of judgment, look at it on the charts, then the Euphrates River it's going to dry up, and it is now drying up, by the way, allowing China's 200 million man army to enter Israel from the east, the kings of the east. 
and then Russia will assemble the remaining armies of the world in that 36 mile long, 18 mile wide, called the Valley of Har Megiddon. But while the nations are preparing to destroy Jerusalem, once and for all, God's going to protect Jerusalem and destroy the armies of all the evil nations with what? With just one word. It's over. There's no battle. There's no battle. There's no war. It's just one word. God said it, and that does it. Now, the prophet Zechariah says that during the battle of Armageddon, Jerusalem will be surrounded. Houses are going to be plundered. Women are going to be raped. And with, all, with half of the city defeated, evil nations will say, oh, man, victory is in sight. Ah, but at the last moment, you ready? Better put some concrete boots on or you're going to come out of that pew. Jesus will return to fight against those nations. Here's what the Bible says. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. All Jerusalem will mourn when they see Christ, and not only will the Lord defeat the nations of the world, but according to Romans eleven twenty five and 26, the remaining remnant of the seed of Abraham, not all Jews, but the remaining remnant of the seed of Abraham will be saved, or otherwise God is not a promise-keeping God. God promised Abraham he would be the father of many nations, and he would save them in the end, and that's going to happen right at that moment. Revelation 19, John said, Christ will bring the armies of heaven with him, which would include the saints of the ages and all the angels. Mark it down. That's us, folks. And so we will see the return of Christ because we will be with the return of Christ when he comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen to the Apostle John describe the battle of the ages. Ready? Revelation 19, 15 through 16. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. That's a word so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 19-21. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized along with the false prophet who performed the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive, thrown alive into the lake of fire, which means they will never die. See, eternal death is eternal dying. There's no annihilation. Like eternal life is eternal living, eternal death is eternal dying. And he threw them alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds, meaning the buzzards, if you will, were filled with their flesh. Beloved, the Bible says all of the nations of the world will be destroyed at the battle of Armageddon and that will bring this age to a close. The rapture won't do it. The tribulation won't do it. But when Jesus comes again, it brings this age to a close. Revelation eleven fifteen. John said, When the seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever and forever. Oh, I wish we could sing the Hallelujah Chorus right now. Now, during those same seven years, every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe the last time I'll be able to speak about this for some while, so be careful here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15, Paul said this, No other foundation can anyone lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, in other words, the foundation of faith is Jesus Christ. Okay, we all working on the foundation. But if anyone builds on that foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, they're going to be rewarded. But if they build with wood, hay, and straw, it's, uh, it's going to, it won't even mount a puff of smoke. And I submit to you there are, folks going, there, there are things going on today in the churches that um, will not even, <laughs> they won't even be a, a whiff of smoke. You won't be able to smell it. It's, it's all works of man for the benefit of man. It's the Laodicean, church of and by and for man. So each one's work is going to become clear. 
For the day will come when it's declared, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built of it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved as through fire. So we have to be careful. One of the things I've tried to stress to you was this. It's not only the works or the amount of our works that reveal their true value, but is the, it's the motive of our works. Is there a motive to draw attention to ourselves? Is the motive is to, um, to draw attention to some human entity? Or is the motive to bring glory to God? Were those good works done for the recognition of man or for the glory of God, which means whatever we're called to do, whatever we're called to do, one more time, whatever we're called to do, do it as unto the Lord. No matter how insignificant you think your work might be, do it as unto the Lord. Wash dishes as unto the Lord. Uh, cut the grass as unto the Lord. Whatever you can find to do, do it as unto the Lord. After the judgment seat of Christ, and after we have laid our crowns at his feet, we will return with Christ to this earth and be united with Christ in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 7 through 10. The Apostle John wrote, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb been thinking about this. I can't find the evidence to support, support my view, but I'm going to give you what I think here. You know, there's a new name written down in glory for us. I won't be called Wayne. You won't be called by your name. God has given to each one of us a name. You know, he changed a lot of people's names in the Bible to reflect their character or their calling. And I suspect we're going to see our new name written down in glory because it's going to reflect who we are, what we've done, and what he's called us to do. But when we go to that marriage supper of the Lamb, I wonder if there'll be a placard right there with our name. It'll be the new name written down in glory, and we'll recognize it at that time. Now, as you recall in Matthew 26, 29, Jesus told his disciples, okay, guys, I'm not going to drink this supper henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you. Where? When? In my new kingdom, in my Father's kingdom. That will be the first time we'll have the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's presence will be there. Wow. The ransomed and redeemed and the and the raptured believers will have a special place at the table. I think we'll have a card there with our new name on it. And but for those who believed in Jesus Christ, from Adam to John the Baptist, those who received Christ as their Savior during the tribulation, they will be there as well, but they will be as invited guests. It will be the marriage supper of the Lamb with the bride of Christ. That's the church. Those who received Christ from, the, from Pentecost to the rapture. Yes, other believers will be there as what? As invited guests. It's the marriage supper marriage supper of the Lamb and the Bride of Christ. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus will inaugurate his reign over the earth for a thousand years. He's going to put down all rebellion of man. He's going to restore the earth to its former peace. He will vindicate and avenge himself and all those who believe in him. You remember when the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. This is exactly what's going to happen right here. Exalt, he will exalt the saints of all the ages to positions of kings and priests according to his evaluation of our works. He will judge the nations according to their righteousness, and he will restore a righteous government on this earth. For the first time since before the Garden of Eden, the government will be led by the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We read it at Christmas time, but it's really when, the, when Jesus comes again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the birth and the ministry of, of God, a ministry of Christ on the earth. But now watch this. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's when he comes again. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David... God promised that they would always be a throne of David. And upon the throne of David and his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice forevermore. He will restore all things as they were before sin entered in the world and before God condemned it with a curse. Genesis 3, God cursed the serpent for deceiving Adam and Eve to the ground you go. 
God then added labor pains to the blessings of childbirth because of Eve's sin. God then added labor pains to the blessings of providing for the family because of Adam's sin. But the curse, but the curse also included disease and decay and delinquency and depravity and demonism and finally physical death and eternal death. In that song that we sing at Christmas time, the great hymn writer Isaac Watts said, On the day Jesus touches earth again, no more will sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground, for he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Can you imagine living on earth without having to fight the curse of sin, without having any temptation to sin whatsoever? Now, the word millennium is derived from the two Latin words, milli, which means a thousand, and annus, which means a year, a thousand years. Millennium means a thousand years. When he returns, Jesus will establish his headquarters there in Jerusalem, maybe not right where it is right now, but just around that area. And he will establish his headquarters there and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords physically reigning upon this earth. Daniel 2.44, the young prophet wrote, The God of heaven will set up a new kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Matthew 19.28, Jesus referred to this as a regeneration, a time of new birth and new life. Acts 3.19, Luke referred to it as times of refreshing, when the earth will be flooded with righteousness. In Ephesians 1.10, the apostle Paul referred to it as a time of fullness. In Philippians 1.6, Paul referred to it as the day of Christ. Theologians of old referred to it as paradise regained, as everything will return to the way it was when God first created the heavens and the earth. Can you imagine what that's going to be when we live without the curse of sin? Beloved, the hope of every Christian ought to be to reign with Christ in that new kingdom, which is to come. Quit trying to make this earth our eternal kingdom. It's never going to happen. When Jesus comes again, he will set up his own new kingdom. Since the day Adam and Eve sinned and fell short of the glory of God, man has longed for a return to the age of peace and righteousness, part of the sustaining joy that gets us up in the morning, that gets us through the troubles of the day, and even through those final hours of death, is that blessed hope of reigning with Christ on this earth for a thousand years, and then in that new heaven and new earth forever, world without end. Prophets have predicted it. Poets still write about it. Hymns and choruses try to describe it. And politicians try to promise it and produce it. But no one, no one, no one has ever been able to bring it about. And they never will. But beloved, such a world is coming. When Jesus came the first time, he dealt with spiritual issues. But when he returns again, he's going to deal with the, with the material things. When Jesus came the first time, he came as a servant. But when he comes again, he's going to come as our sovereign Lord. When Jesus came the first time, they nailed him to a tree. When he comes again, he will seated, be seated on his throne, and he will never be removed from that throne forever. Now, that's the beginning of the sermon. There are three things I want you to see about that kingdom. Number one, the inauguration. How in the world is that kingdom going to begin? Well, let me tell you how it's not going to be beginning. It will not be brought about through the preaching of the gospel. Now, I believe we should share the gospel uh, of Christ to every year, uh, far and near. Uh, the, I believe in the preaching of the word of God, or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. But contrary to the dominionist and the kingdom now proponents and those who are involved in the new apostolic Ref reformation, the preaching will not usher in the kingdom of God. You've heard preachers say, uh, that we've got to get the gospel to the ends of the world, and then the end will come. No, 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 no. Listen, who's going to be the final witnesses? 144,000 Jews and those two witnesses in Jerusalem. The church doesn't have to do that job all by ourselves. Acts 15, 14 says, Through the preaching of the gospel, God is calling out a people unto himself who will become the saints of his kingdom. In other words, a people for his name. And uh, yes, we're to preach the gospel to our neighbors and to the nations, and yes, we're to occupy the world until he comes, but listen to me carefully. Because you have these folks out there right now who are saying if we can kind of a name it and claim it and we can, you know, bind Satan here, bind Satan there, uh, cast Satan out here. We don't have the power to do that, folks. Uh, Linda and I tried that early on in our ministry, and I still have the heebie-jeebies when I realize 
how deeply we got into that we're novices and we should not have been doing what we were doing. God has not given us the mandate nor the spiritual authority to vanquish evil before Christ returns. That is, he, 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 Christ alone is the peace giver. He is the prince of peace. We don't have that power. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can subdue evil. We don't have that power. Second, the millennial kingdom of God will not be brought about by organized religion, praise God. In fact, the Bible says organized religion will move towards apostasy, as we now see. Evangelicalism is certainly not moving toward a revival. <laughs> Evangelicalism is certainly not moving toward righteousness. Evangelicalism, whether it's under the banner of liturgicalism or uh, Laodiceanism, has under the banner of ecumenical unity abandoned the basic fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith in order to establish the one world religion. That's exactly what's going to... So don't get caught up in the success stories of some of these new starts and, and new churches because they're, what they're building is the one world religion that's apart from God. Thirdly, this new kingdom will not be brought about by any government agency or humanitarian effort. The world peace will not be the result of a bumper sticker that says, let's visualize peace. It just won't work. Nor will it be the result of everyone selling their earthly goods and joining a commune or piling up our guns and war machines and burning them. No, no, we'll just build new weapons. Beloved, the millennial kingdom will be inaugurated first by revelation. By revelation, the Lord Jesus will return to this earth. Did you see on the, that 55% of Americans now believe that Jesus is coming again? That's an increase from 40% in 2010. People are, I don't know how they're doing it because their preachers aren't preaching it, but they, they know that the second coming of Christ is the only hope. On the day that Jesus ascended back into heaven, the Bible says he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, and watching the cloud go out of sight and receive them out of sight, the Bible says, as they were gazing intently, which means they were transfixed to get this last glimpse of the glory of the one whom they loved. Their eyes glued upon that ascending Christ. Two men in white clothing stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? Listen to me now. This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come again in just the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Jesus will descend from the heavens just as he ascended into the heavens, literally and physically, and he will plant his feet on the very spot from whence he ascended 2,000 years ago. And I've walked almost all that mountain, and I hope I crossed the place where he's going to put his feet. This does not need to be spiritualized. You don't need to try to, well, it means this. No, no, no. It means what it says. Jesus is coming again. This does not need to be uh, understood any other way. At the end of the great tribulation, Jesus is coming to earth again, and the Bible says, every eye shall see him. And don't give me this thing through television or internet or whatever. I don't know. I don't have to explain it. But the Bible says it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Second, the millennium kingdom will be inaugurated by transformation. Zechariah 14, 4. Again, his feet shall stand that day on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus steps back upon the earth, again, there's going to be a remarkable transformation of all nature. Everything in the universe is going to be transformed, and everything's going to return to the way it was prior to the flood, even before it was in the garden, like, just like it was in the Garden of Eden. That is going to be lifted up, mountains brought low. Romans, the eighth chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul said, the whole creation groans and travails like a woman giving birth, awaiting the day for its deliverance from the curse of sin. Can you imagine? If the, I'm sure the earth is groaning today. Uh, the great Tetons are, are giving us a sign, and all the deliverance, all the floods and the fires and, and all the things that's going on right now, the volcanoes, earth is, is crying out for deliverance from the curse of sin. When Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, the whole nature was cursed with sin. But when Jesus comes to the earth again, all that's going to change. Isaiah 35, 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Can you imagine a world where there will be food? Food will be so plentiful that everyone will have enough to eat, no one will have a hunger pain. No child will go to bed at night without his stomach being full. 
Amos 9, 13 to 15 says, listen, the, 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 the earth is going to become so fertile that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Now, if you, those of you who've never been on the farm don't understand what that means. Okay, here's a combine or the reaper, and it's reaping the harvest of the last sowing, but the, but the plowman who's going to turn the earth over to sow it again is, hurry up out there, I'm right behind you. And he says the plowman's going to overtake the reaper. As farmers are able to plant and harvest their crops all year round. Isaiah eleven six: the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the lad, meaning the child, and the calf and the young lion will fatling together. You're going to see a little child with a leash tied to its hand. But the leash will not be tied to a dog or a domesticated animal. It's going to be tied to a lion or a leopard or a bear. And the Bible says in that day, the aging process will slow down to what it was in the beginning. Now you know why I want the second coming of Christ to come now. So the aging process will slow down. Those believers who survived the great tribulation will continue to have children. And those who are alive at the start of the millennium, as well as those who accept Christ during the millennium, will live out their days for the thousand years. You say, Wayne, come on. How, long, how many years did Methuselah live? A thousand years. Isaiah 65, 20. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. Linda and I have a, have a child in heaven that we will see for the first time. Some of you have lost children in that way. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. The only way that a person born during the millennium would not live the thousand years is because God's going to take them out. Therefore, uh, they, they may be saved, but they won't live on, on the earth for that long. Isaiah 2, 4. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords and the plowshares, Steve, they shall, and the spears and the pruning hooks. And the nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's during the millennial reign of Christ. For the first time since Adam and Eve, there will be worldwide peace. His life returns to a more of a simpler time, as some of you are hoping for and trying to get for today. Even in, in agricultural times, with farms and flocks and vineyards and pastures and, and fruit-bearing trees, plowing and sowing and, and sowing rather, and reaping and preserving that's the way our forefathers lived. That's the way Linda and I lived when we came up. But without the curse of sin on the land, we will have to, we'll pick the blackberries without the briars. You see what I'm talking about? No briars, no weeds, no inclement weather, and without the threat of robbers or thieves or murderers coming in and taking what you have. That is the millennial reign of Christ. Third, the millennial reign of Christ will be inaugurated by an incarceration. Somebody's going to get locked up forever. Revelation 20, verse 1, following, the Bible says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, the bottomless pit, and um, a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, for a thousand years, even the power of the devil will not be present, much less the devil himself. But that doesn't mean there will be no sin. Why? Because sin is not caused by the devil. Sin is caused by the heart. Sin is bound up in the heart. Sin is the result of man's fallen nature. And the humans who are alive in the millennium will still battle with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But they won't have the corrupted culture to fan the flames of that temptation. It will still be there. Because such things will be dealt with instantly and with exactness. For the millennial reign will be a worldwide theocratic government headed by the Lord Jesus. They can hear him teach. They can go to him with their counsel. For counsel. They can go to him with their problems. They, they will hear him personally. The resurrected saints will reign with him during the millennial kingdom. The apostles, the apostles will be raised again. And they will rule over the twelve nations of Israel, which is why there were 12 apostles to begin with. And by the way, there are no more apostles. These um, glory-hungry folks who name themselves apostles, so and so, so they're, they're phony, baloney, plastic, but a good time, Charlie. They're, they're not true. And while the rest of the saints will be assigned as priests and kings in the different parts of the earth, that's us. There will be civil and religious laws for all nations. 
Nations will be required to send representatives to Jerusalem once a year to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords. However, while all believers will have their assignments in the kingdom of heaven, only those, only those, one more time, only those who recognize him as Lord in this life, in this life, will rule and reign with him in that life which is yet to come. Number two, look at the administration, how the kingdom will operate. Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Jesus Christ will rule and to reign on this earth as he is now ruling in heaven. And, he will, and we will be ruling with him. Luke 19, 20, 12 through 27, Jesus told the parable that describes what life would be like in that millennial. Now, in verse 12, here's the parable. Jesus said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom, and then he's going to return. But he called his ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds, and that day there will be amount of money. And he said, Occupy, do something with this until I come. Well, each servant received the same amount, and some of them used their money to make more, some ten pounds, some gained five pounds, and, and some kind of hid their money away so that nobody would steal it. What did he mean by the term pounds? Well, obviously he turned money, but in our day it meant the gospel. That's exactly what he was trying to say to us. What did he mean by the term occupy? Well, share the gospel. Share the, you're the witness. Share your testimony. Be about the tasks that I assign you, because there will be day, a day of reckoning when we stand before the Lord. Jesus said when the nobleman came back from his journey, he called his servants unto him and said, okay, give an account of what you've done with that which I entrusted you. In verse 17, he told one of them, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little down here. Now you're going to have authority over ten cities. You get this? Whatever we do with what God has gifted us with here is what we will do in the millennial kingdom forever and forever. The nobleman was also gracious to the servant who earned only five pounds. Okay, you didn't do exactly what you should have done, but you did better, and so I'll give you the equal amount of responsibility in the kingdom. When it came to the third one, the one who hid his pounds in his handkerchief that no one would steal it, he said, you wicked servant, you wicked servant, uh, take the pounds from that wicked servant and give it to the servant who knows what to do with it. For he had proven himself to his master that he knew how to be good, a good steward of God's resources. Beloved, if, some, if God has gifted you with some ability or strength or uh, ability even to make money and donate money, whatever it is, or, or serve or visit or pray or witness or whatever, you had better be exercising that gift right now. Which of the three servants describes you? Have you shared the gospel with anyone? How about this morning? What's your problem? Must I go and empty-handed, thus my Redeemer meet, with not one day of service to give him, lay no trophy at his feet? Beloved, the treasures we store up in heaven are the souls of those we have by our lips or by our lives led to faith in Jesus Christ, as their Savior and the Lord. What will we hear our Lord say to us on that day when we will see him very soon? Find of the consummation, how the kingdom will conclude. Revelation 20, verse 3. John said, and, I, and they cast him, the devil, into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive, deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that, he must be loosed for a little while. Now, I've always had problems with this. Let me see if I can help you understand at least what I understand. Why would God let Satan loose again? Why not let that old fellow remain down there in the bottom of his pit forever and ever and ever? You got this guy, why are you going to let him loose? Well, it has to do with that final battle between Satan and the Savior. And in some Bibles and some commentaries, they refer to this as the Gog Magog War. It's not. It's, it's the battle of the final battle of the ages. The millennial kingdom is an earthly kingdom. It will be populated by human beings, earthly people, as well as us glorified saints. The earthly people will reproduce after their kind and after a thousand years without the curse preventing births. There will be a lot of folks on this earth most of whom will still be, are you ready for this? Unbelievers. So to reveal their true nature, Satan is released to attract the unbelievers unto himself. 
And the Bible says the number of them, listen, will be as great as the, as the grain, grain, the sand on the seashore. Can you imagine? Listen, over the years I've had people tell me, I, I remember one father telling me this in probably 1975 or 6. I've had people, if we could just create a Christian culture, we could attract more people into heaven. Parents beg churches, establish events with a Christian atmosphere where their kids might be influenced to believe in God and accept Christ as their Savior. These family life centers and all the events and, and uh, all the sporting events and other events that they do, they, oh, let's just do all this in a Christian atmosphere so we can attract them into heaven. The millennial will be such a Christian culture. Can you imagine this? Jesus literally, physically, will be sitting on his throne. They can see him. They can listen to him. They can learn from him. They can watch others serve him. And they can, watch, they can, and they can worship him and see what happens to those who do not worship him. They can see. It's the most Christian culture you could ever get. Christ is here. Everything we believe about Jesus by faith they will be able to see by sight. However, a perfect environment does not create a perfect heart. Jesus said, unless one is what? Born again. They cannot see. They cannot understand. They cannot comprehend the kingdom of heaven. And Revelation 20.10 says, they will be devoured by fire from heaven, and the one who deceived them will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, tormented day and night, tormented day and night, forever and forever and forever and forever. Revelation 21, 6 through 8, John said, Jesus said to him, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's going to be a tragic day. That's the great white throne judgment. We hope to talk about that a little bit next Sunday. Beloved, every true believer who has any understanding of the Scriptures and any love for the Lord Jesus Christ longs for the day when Christ Jesus returns to this earth to establish his kingdom upon this earth. Without the second coming of Christ, there's really no purpose for his first coming. In fact, his second coming is the culmination of his first coming. It's where he finally receives the justification and the glorification and the exaltation for all the humiliation he suffered when he came to earth the first time. Because he came as a suffering servant. When he comes again, he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords. The underlying cause of the failure of every form of government is the same. Nimrod tried it. Hitler tried it. Rome tried it. For the last 2,000 years, most of the governments of the world have tried it. America's trying it today. It won't work. They want to create world peace through uniformity and obedience to their rules and their concept of life. They want to replace God with their form of government so they can rule the world, but it won't work. And beloved, that is why God is about to unleash a level of tribulation on this earth, the likes of which we've never known before. My fear is rather than seeking God's kingdom and God's righteousness, even many of God's people are seeking uh, to enhance the comforts of their own kingdom on this earth. It won't work. It's going to fall. It's going to fail. And unless there's true revival that will lead God's people to true repentance, our form of government, which is the last of its kind in the world, will also perish. And with it, our freedoms, and more importantly, our children's future. Let me close with this comment here. Historians document the lifespan of a democracy is somewhere between 200 and 250 years. No democracy has, has lasted beyond 250 years. America's Declaration of Independence was signed July 4, 1776, which means, according to my calculations, we're about 247 years old, and we're nearing the end of the average lifespan. Historians document the life cycle of a society as follows like this pattern, from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance,
from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back to bondage. The consensus of conservative Bible teachers in America is that we are in that last stage right now, unless, and unless God intervenes, we will soon be in bondage to a communist China. And the last constitutional form of government on this earth will be replaced with Marxist socialism. We'll talk more about that on July 11th, God willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you now take your expressed word and would you drill it into the hearts of those who are reluctant to receive it because it is the only truth that will set us free from our longings for peace on this earth apart from Christ. There will never be true peace on this earth until we accept Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace and receive him as our Savior and Lord. Until we are born again as believers in Jesus Christ, we'll never see that throne of peace. So, Father, would you speak to every heart here today? Would you have your will and your way? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to change.